Good evening, uh, I'm Tony Jones. Welcome to a special Q&A, our Energy Future, live from the Docklands in Melbourne, here to answer your questions. The CEO of Energy Consumers Australia, Rosemary Sinclair. Federal Environment and Energy Minister, Josh Frydenberg. The head of the Climate Council, Amanda McKenzie. Chief Scientist, Alan Finkel, who's just delivered an independent review of the Australian electricity system. And the Shadow Energy Minister, Mark Butler. Please welcome our panel. The Q&A is live on ABC TV and radio at 9.35 Eastern Standard Time. You can stream us live on iView, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter Periscope. Well, last Friday, Australia's Chief Scientist Alan Finkel delivered the blueprint for the National Electricity Network. The review tried to balance reliability, security, price and reduce carbon emissions to meet our targets on climate change. The central conclusion is that business as usual, 10 years of political opportunism and inaction is not an option. But will our political leaders rise to the challenge? Tonight is your chance to test them. And the first question comes from Mick Eit. My question is about putting a price on carbon, on pollution, basically. Um, I think many of us will remember Four years ago, we had an election. We saw the coalition more or less win on the promise that by slashing the carbon tax, every family in this country would get $500 back. I don't know about you, but in our family, we didn't see these $500. I, I've seen prices of electricity rising every year since then. And, you know, actually, experts around the world are telling us that putting a price on carbon, on pollution, is the most efficient way that we can, we can deal with the challenge of climate change. It, it actually works. It's very simple, you know. People who want to pollute, that's fine. You want to pollute, but then you pay. And then you reward those who don't. Simple. My, my children understand that system. So my, my question is to you, Dr. Finkel, because I understand that in the beginning, at first, you actually had some sort of a polluters pay system in, you, in the work that you're doing this review. But uh, on Friday, what we saw published didn't have, have any of that. That solution had been taken out. So why did you take it out? Alan Finkel, start with you. Well, just to be clear, in our preliminary report last December, we made no recommendations whatsoever. And any discussion that we had was in reference to work that had been done by the Australian Energy Market Commission, that's the rule maker for the electricity industry and the Climate Change Authority. And we then had to pick up and do our own work. And we spent six months uh, in consultations around the country and internationally uh, doing comparative modelling. And we looked at a number of different mechanisms. I presume that in your question you're referring to the emissions intensity scheme. We looked at that. We looked at a clean energy <coughs> target. And we looked at them with no pre-existing prejudice whatsoever. We looked at them on their merits. Can I just interrupt there? You decided on the clean energy target. We wouldn't have spent too long going over the one you didn't decide on. So the, so the clean energy target is effectively a price on carbon or not? The clean energy target is an incentive to bring new, low emissions and reliable energy into the market. It's critically important. We just don't want to go through the situation that we've seen, say, in February this year in South Australia and New South Wales, where the system just ran out of energy. We need to be bringing new generation in to replace the exits of Hazelwood and Northern and Playford. The, it's been shown around the world that the existing market based on purely trading energy no longer is effective at sending the investment signals to the people who will build the new generation in the way that it did when all we had was variations on traditional generation. So the clean energy target is a means of incentivising according to how good they are new low emissions generators into the market. So energy retailers, if I understand this correctly, mm -hmm. AGL, Origin, Energy Australia and a host of others, they'll have to buy, they'll have to purchase certificates from the electricity generators. Does that not place a price on carbon? Because what they're paying for is low emission certificates. So you, you really need not to break up a mechanism and look at the details. You need to look at what the outcome is. What we're trying to achieve is the best 
co-optimization of a number of things. You mentioned in your introductory comments security, reliability, affordability and low emissions. What we have found is when we do comparisons <coughs> within the same modelling rubric that the clean energy target, which is a combination of certificates purchased by retailers and benefits to the new generators, delivers the lowest prices for residential consumers and for industrial consumers going forward. So, Tony, I think it's important to focus on outcomes rather than Yes, I, I, it's, in some respects, I'm not the Tony you need to explain <laughs> this to, because <laughs> there is a Tony Abbott out there who says the system is a magic pudding and effectively is putting a tax on coal. Is that true or not? Well, I absolutely see it as an incentive to bring in low emissions generation. And if it's effective at doing that, and we get the reliability that we want, need, and we get the uh, lower emissions that we've committed to through our national uh, commitments through Paris, then it's working for us. Mm. And it truly is designed as an incentive mechanism. So I, I just can't go any further than that. But you can say, can't you, that if you have to purchase certificates, you're putting a price on low emissions? No, you're putting an incentive on low emissions, and you can interpret it however you wish. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually quite serious. Let me we ask, see well, it as you're, an sitting, you're sitting next to a, a, um, Mr. Butler from the Labor Party, and I'd like to know whether you think there's a price been put on carbon here. Well, uh, the Grattan Institute said last week, and I think they were right about this, that these are all versions of carbon pricing mechanisms. There's not the same direct mm. price imposed on coal-fired generators as there would be in the emissions intensity scheme that the questioner was asking about. But what this does is to give a price advantage to low emissions technology. So it seeks to shift the relative costs of different types of electricity generation based on their carbon emissions. So of course it's a price on carbon. Now it's not a direct price, but there's clearly a shadow price, if Dr Finkel's recommendations are accepted, a shadow price signal based on carbon would be operating in the electricity sector. Now so if that's not a carbon can, can price, you, I'm not sure what that, is. By the way, do you accept that it is a shadow <laughs> price or a price of some sort on carbon? Look, you know, is it, too, is it we, very we hard to say this? We, we live in a world of carrots and sticks. The EIS, the other mechanism that's been talked about uh, is a world of carrots and sticks where high emitting generators, brown coal and black coal, are actually penalised for their emissions um, and the low emissions generators are rewarded. The clean energy target is all about the carrot, the rewards. Okay, we'll go to another question which is going to lead us to the politics of this. It's from Will Bennett. Thanks, Tony. Um, for the past 10 years, politics has overpowered policy in climate change and energy. With the release of this report, we now have a pragmatic and realistic blueprint, blueprint for the future. Under Dr Finkel's plan, a clean energy target means coal may play a role, but it is not essential. Of paramount importance is bipartisan support, without which we have no hope of achieving the required investment. Josh, do you feel confident you'll be able to get support within your party particularly from the backbench, to adopt such a target? Well, thanks for your question, uh, Will. I, I think my colleagues, and I've obviously spoken to a lot of them over recent days, understand that business as usual is not an option and that the problem we need to solve for is a level of regulatory certainty which will incentivise or see new investment. Because we've seen nine coal-fired power stations close in Australia over the last five years, but we haven't seen sufficient generation coming into the mix. And I think what's so important about Dr Finkel's report is that it does, through the clean energy target, provide a market signal to see further investment. It does, through the stability measures, ensure that we can properly integrate um, more intermittent sources of power, namely wind and solar, into the system, into the grid, without seeing a repeat of what we saw in South Australia. And it is also consistent with the Paris targets that we signed up to under Tony Abbott of a 26 to 28 per cent reduction by 2030 on our 2005 Now, Josh, levels. since you've mentioned Tony Abbott, um, I mentioned him a moment ago, is this scheme effectively a tax on coal? Because that's what your former leader says it is. No, it's not a tax on coal. And what Did you manage to convince him otherwise? Because <laughs> I know you've spoken to him recently. I have spoken to him and it was a very <coughs> constructive um, conversation. Um, Tony has... Um, <laughs> everyone would love to be a fly on the wall for those. But, um, uh, I mean, what Tony has said today, he set himself two criteria, two benchmarks 
uh, for a future mechanism in this space, whether it puts downward pressure on prices and whether it would allow coal continue to continue. And I think <laughs> the clean energy target does that. And we have to come back to the trilemma. And we're dealing with affordability, which Rosemary knows all too well through putting consumers first. We're dealing with stability, with Mark, which Mark knows all too well coming from the state of South Australia. And we're dealing with uh, Paris uh, commitments, which Amanda knows well. So we've got this challenge and you can't please everybody, but what we do need to do is better than we've done in the past. And I don't think Australia has been well served by the argy-bargy of politics in this area because we've seen higher prices, a less stable system, and so now it's time but for change. Josh, what everyone wants to know is what's going to happen when you go into the party room tomorrow mm. and certain <laughs> prominent figures from the past stand up and say you've put a tax on coal, that well, you've created a magic pudding system here. I mean, <laughs> and it won't just be one person, will it? Well, look, I'm sure there will be a few of my colleagues, and rightly so, who want to know m more detail. And having spoken to them, a lot of them have already read Dr Finkel's report, and, you know, they have got questions for me on, on various aspects of it. Are they asking you whether or not this is putting a price on carbon and therefore, as they would see it, no, a tax on um, coal? No, they're wanting to know that the energy mix of the future will serve Australians well in terms of that trilemma, and understandably so. And under Dr Finkel's model, coal will still continue to play an important part of the energy mix. It does, you know, not all electrons are created equal. It does provide certain stability services that you get from baseload power, and that can be hydro, it can be gas, or it can be coal. And we can't just transition overnight to a new energy mix without making allowances for those differences. Okay, so one very brief question. You've obviously done a lot of calling around your colleagues. Do you have the numbers, do you think, to carry the day on this issue? Well, I'm not taking a position, <coughs> a particular policy, to the party room tomorrow. What I'm going to do with my colleagues is take them through uh, the changes that we're seeing in the energy system, what Dr Finkel himself has described as the most significant in more than a century, and then repeat to them what are the key conclusions of the Finkel review. And out of that will come some discussions. But this process has got a long way to run. Uh, we've taken a long time to get here. There are a lot of complications. It's state and federal dynamics, and I, and I hope tomorrow is a step forward. All right, let's hear from the other panellists. Uh, Rosemary, mm -hmm. you're here representing consumers mm -hmm. effectively. So what do you think consumers think about the way politics as in, has enmeshed these issues over the past decade? Mm -hmm. Consumers um, have been thinking about these issues um, deeply and carefully. Uh, we study um, consumer sentiment every six months through a survey that we do. And what we're hearing um, from that survey is that there's a real concern that this market, as it is at the moment, is not working in their interests. So people understand that there's something wrong with this market. And I think that uh, most people would see uh, Dr Finkel's report as an opportunity <coughs> to reset this market and focus it much more on outcomes for consumers. Um, on the affordability question, um, consumers are seeing and are going to see significant price rises coming through the wholesale energy market. And that's because we don't have a mechanism in place to bring further supply into the market. Consumers in our survey are understanding that there's a supply issue and something needs to be done about it. Of all the mechanisms and the modelling and the evidence and the discussion that's going on, it seems to us that the clean energy target is the least cost way of changing the generation mix from a current level of around about 13% renewables to, I think, in the order of 40% renewables by 2030. And for that reason, we think it's an idea that really deserves very careful consideration <coughs> by everybody, politicians, industry, and it's certainly getting a lot of consideration by consumers. OK, Amanda McKenzie, let's get your perspective from the Climate mm. Council. Well, as others have said, the lack of climate policy, the lack of um, any sort of national plan on energy has been driving up <laughs> emissions and it's been driving up prices. And this policy is a, is a way forward through that. And whether it's an EIS, a CPRS, an RET, uh, all of the different acronyms we've heard, 
the ultimate question we need to ask is, is this going to tackle the climate change crisis that we're facing? And we see that starkly when we look at the Great Barrier Reef, the mass bleaching that's occurred two years in a row, the worsening heat waves, hot days doubling in Australia in the last 50 years. And so looking at this report in, through that lens, it doesn't go far enough. And there's three reasons for that. The first is that it doesn't get emissions down as far as they need to go. The second is it should be doing far more on coal. We need to be retiring coal-fired generators. And this, this report envisages uh, coal-fired generators being part of the mix till 2050, where, whereas we need to get to net zero emissions by then. And also, we need to get further on renewable energy is the third point. We can do better than 42% in renewables by 2030. It should be well over 50% if we're going to be tracking to the Paris commitments. Do you, very briefly, do you back the blueprint as a kind of model um, where the targets can go up and down, it can be used to reach whatever political target mm. is set by the government of the day? The critical element for us is whether the policy can be ratcheted up over time. So as uh, Josh and his colleagues consider what the legislation would look like if they do in, in fact adopt the policy, what would be important for us is what is those emission restrictions and is there a ratcheting up mechanism over time? OK, I'm just going to quickly go back to our uh, questioner, Will Bennett. I know you, you originally asked a double barrel question. You also wanted to know what the Labor Party was up to on this. Yeah, well, I just think that the key point is getting a policy <coughs> in place f first. And, you know, I don't, I'm wary of history repeating itself as what happened in 2009 um, with the um, with Rudd's ETS. And, you know, we'd be in a lot... We'd be in a different situation now if that had gotten through. So I think the important thing is bipartisan support first and then... If um, Mark is fortunate enough to win government, then he can ratchet that up. But I think it's uh, just getting something in place is more Let, important. Let's go to Mark Butler. Is so that, that that's the plan? Is that the plan? <laughs> <laughs> Describe it for Very us. Very perceptive. Describe it, gentlemen. Uh, to get Josh to do all the hard work, then lose, and then hand it over. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you see this something like an emissions trading scheme that you can ratchet up when necessary? Well. We were asked by a coalition of business groups, um, some environment groups, ACOS, the ACTU, uh, a couple of days ago to give Dr Finkel's report full and fair consideration and that's what we've committed to do. So we're studying it carefully, we're going to engage carefully with stakeholders. In due course we'll engage with the government about this, talk to state governments. Uh, what we have said though that is that even though we had a clear preference for a different type of model, the emissions intensity scheme that Dr Finkel's referred to. We are willing to put that aside, and even though we took it to the election as our policy and talk about a clean energy target framework, if that is the only basis on which we can have some discussions across the aisle with the government, then we are willing to put that aside. We think it is a framework that can work. Um, you know, I think there are still some attractions in the EIS that aren't there, but it is a framework that can work, provided you get the design right and provided it scalable, because that, that the really important point Amanda makes is that Dr Finkel was not asked to come up with an appropriate level of emissions reduction in the electricity sector by 2030 or 2050. Now, the government's not asked anyone to do that. It ignored the Climate Change Authority's advice about that. So we're working within the parameters of Tony Abbott's targets that he set internally without independent advice. Now, so long as we can put that aside and say, is this a mechanism that can endure, provided it's scaled up in accordance so with well, independent let, let advice? Just, ex just explain to us briefly. Uh, you've looked at it. You've got some glimpse of it. So, mm. And you know that it can theoretically be scaled up by changing the prices and the target. Mm. So how would you do it if you got into government? Well, we'd take some further advice about, about this. I mean, we, we've had the view going back several years from when we were in government that, that when it comes to emissions reduction targets and a whole lot of the policy mechanisms about implementing it, it's important that government get objective expert advice about making sure that we're doing what is necessary to get the emissions down to keep global warming below two degrees, to and make so, sure okay, that we're complying Let's say we understand Paris. that point. Mm. Yep. How would you use the clean energy target to scale up? How would you do it? Well, we'd have to get advice about what the appropriate, what the appropriate contribution by the electricity sector to the economy-wide emissions reduction task was. Now, Dr Finkel has assumed, as was 
his brief, that, that the electricity sector would do only its sort of mathematical share of the 28% reduction that is the government's policy. Whether that's really the right thing, given that electricity can drive changes in transport indirectly, tra changes in industry indirectly, I think is still an open question. But that's not the question we have before us. The question we have before us is whether the clean energy target and some of the other policies that Dr Finkel has proposed are able to be discussed between the government and the opposition finally to break this impasse that, that um, has really been with us for almost a decade now, that is holding back investment and driving up power bills for consumers that Rosemary represents and for many businesses that employ hundreds and hundreds of thousands of workers. OK, well, uh, can we just ask the Chief Scientist, you've designed this scheme. Um, did you design something that could be scaled up by future governments? So the answer is yes. Um, I always urge caution, though, in going into something with the anticipation that you're going to change it straight away anyway. The community, all ends of the community, right from generation through to consumers, needs some predictability. So we haven't actually made a numeric um, recommendation to the government. What we've done is we've modelled the only sensible thing that we can model, and I think a very credible thing to be modelling, which is a trajectory. And it's a big change from where we've been at. Most people are thinking about a target, a 2030 target, and they think about the target in terms of renewables. We're trying to change that discussion from a target to a trajectory out to the future, because if you have a target, then you get there and you say, hey, what next? you might have locked in solutions that you don't want to have for the long term. So you have to have a long term view. And the other thing is we're trying to shift the focus from uh, renewable energy to emissions. So Amanda, you know, you mentioned getting out of coal or getting into renewables. We've tried to actually elevate the discussion to the end point, which is the outcomes. If the right mix of existing coal and, and renewables gives you the emissions reduction trajectory that you want, and we're talking about atmospheric emissions here, not technologies, then that is the, the best outcome. So governments can choose the slope of that trajectory and the clean emissions target will adjust itself to deliver the outcome that governments are looking for. Okay, can I just yes say, you can, yes briefly. Um, you we'll know, we, could, we could reduce our emissions tomorrow by half if we outsourced all our manufacturing jobs to another country. And this is the key point, is that there's a transition underway, but it has to be carefully considered. And indeed, in the Finkel report, they actually issued a note of caution about how much you reduce your emissions in the electricity sector, because our industry is so cost sensitive or price sensitive on this issue. So Mark's team have a 45% emissions reduction target. We have a 26%. They've never modelled the impact of cost of their target on the economy, of the jobs, and you've got the unions who normally would be the backbone of your party issuing again their own concerns about why a higher emissions reduction target will, could cost yeah, thousands we're gonna, of jobs. We're going to come to these issues. Right. We, we've got lots of other questions that we want to get to and everyone will get a chance to get in on them. You can join this conversation on Twitter and on the Q&A Extra, uh, on Facebook Live and ABC News Radio straight after this program. Our next question comes from Justine Lowe. Uh, household electricity prices have doubled in the past decade, hitting the elderly, people on government benefits and small business owners hard. Uh, I'm just wondering how this, uh, with Australia moving away from coal and towards renewables, how this review plans to help affordability for Australia's most vulnerable. Rosemary Sinclair, let's start with you. I mean, it's an obvious question. Consumers want to know how they're going to come out of this. Yeah. Look, I think, Justine, the, um, the focus of our discussion so far has been on one element in the report, and that's the clean energy target. The report has actually uh, significant things to say about the consumer's experience in the retail market. And it also has very significant things to say about accountability and outcomes, including affordability. So one of the things that we are most pleased about in the report is that there will be a national report on matters including affordability to the COAG Leaders um, Council uh, every, every year. And we think that that will bring that issue to the fore every year. Um, what you say is absolutely correct. For low-income households, the percentage that they have to spend on electricity um, is very, very significant. And whereas for some people a $10 a week rise in some costs doesn't matter, for those households it really does matter. 
And even the Treasurer has been telling us that incomes growth is not keeping pace with cost growth. So we really have to keep an eye on this. The research that we've done says that the community in general does not want anybody left behind as we manage our way through this transition. And that's going to mean that we need some new ideas and continued focus on income vulnerable households, but also on households that need heating or cooling for health reasons. And small business is a different example where you can't always shift your load. If your business is cooking fish and chips for dinner, then that's when you need to cook them, not after 10 o'clock at night. I think what Dr Finkel's suggesting in the consumer reward, consumer aspect of his report provides us with good opportunities to bring these things into sharper focus. Josh Frydenberg. Well, I think Rosemary makes a very important point about the way the retailers go about it because one of the big retailers found that there were 26,000 of their vulnerable customers uh, who were on the higher existing offers. So I think the retailers could do better at moving um, some of their vulnerable customers onto to lower offers. A low income household spends about five times as much as a proportion of their income than a higher income household on electricity. Um, the, pr what, the reason why the prices have gone up substantially recently, it's the wholesale price, but historically it's been the networks, the poles and wires, and that you would have heard the term gold plating and the like. So what we are trying to do under Malcolm Turnbull is to rein in those costs of both the networks and the retailers and I think that together with some of our other initiatives around gases and providing more gas supply to the market, I think that could put downward pressure significantly on prices. Amanda. I think um, in a question like this we need to ask why did the problem exist in the first place and we've, Dr Finkel noted this in the report, the two big reasons were that there was no climate policy and so with that uncertainty there was no more investment in energy and also increasing gas prices which is due to the linkage of our gas prices with international markets. So what is their solution then? Rosemary has said this, Josh has said this, we need more supply in the market and what we know now and Dr Finkel notes this in his report is that renewable energy is now the cheapest source of power. You just have to look to a new wind farm in Ballarat that came in at $50 a megawatt hour, which is half the cost of new coal-fired generation. So renewables wins hands down when it comes to, on cost, what is going to be the best new source of generation. Now, Josh, um, one of the part of the Finkel recommendations include programs for poorer people. They include options for subsidising rooftop solar power and battery storage for low-income <coughs> households. Is that something that you're going to move towards? Oh, look, we'll consider uh, in full the Finkel report. Yeah, but you know what the recommendations yeah, are. But, uh, That's I, a key recommendation. Absolutely. Is and it one you back? Well, there's certainly merit in more storage for households. And mm. we have now... But this is government subsidising yeah, low-income houses... Absolutely. ..for rooftop solar and batteries. Yeah. And one and of... you support that? Well... Um, Tony, um, <laughs> as you know... Well, you were saying absolutely. No, no, I'm saying... <laughs> He's warming you up for the no, party. No, Tony, yeah, tonight. can I say one thing I'm very careful of in this job... Is pink bats. <laughs> That's what <laughs> um, What well, about we should, solar? Exactly, that, and that wasn't our party's policy. Yep. Um, on the issue of uh, the Finkel report in its entirety, um, we have to have a proper uh, cabinet consideration of its recommendations. We just got the report. It's more than 200 pages in length. We then go to the party room and have a full discussion there. I would not want to preempt um, the views of my colleagues on any of those matters, but point out that Australia has the highest uptake of solar panels on people's roofs anywhere in the world on a per capita basis. But do you, but Josh, do you support the idea of more that low income houses should be subsidised to have these assets? Well, I support helping low income households in any which way we can, but as for the in, the specific recommendations, that is something right. we have to take through. Rosemary, want to jump in there yes, briefly? I, I'm happy to uh, speak perhaps uh, more directly and a little earlier um, on this particular topic because <coughs> it, uh, it springs from Justine's comment earlier. Uh, when we look at the issue of public housing, we see that in some circumstances we are setting up low-income households in Australia for the worst results in terms of uh, electricity prices and management. So the quality of the housing stock is something we 
absolutely have to look at and that's an important recommendation in Dr Finkel's report. We also need to look at the efficiency of the appliances in these households mm -hmm. because again we can be setting people up for failure by giving them cheap but inefficient appliances. What we've seen already though is considerable action by state governments looking at how to provide panels and batteries and efficient appliances to these households through a range of different mechanisms. Uh, we're seeing some early signs of industry coming in to support these initiatives. Um, so we think that there's movement there and having this recommendation in Dr Finkel's report again brings it into sharp focus that we can't just leave people in poor quality housing with inefficient appliances and expect to get the good result that the community wants us to get. Okay, well I'll quickly go to the side of the panel and Alan I'll start with you and, and then Mark but um, those important, they're important recommendations I dare say because you put them in um, they, prominently for what you should do for low income households. Th they are indeed. If you look at our report which focuses on four key outcomes, one of the four, we referred to it not as affordability or low cost, we ended up referring to it as rewarding consumers and there are so many elements to it. The very first is just lowering the prices. We can't promise a return to low, low prices of the past but from our modelling and from the analysis that we've put into it we feel we've got the recommendations that will lead to the lowest prices that one could expect going forward. But then there are many other things um, that have been discussed, I won't repeat them, but another one is what's called demand response. Consumers can manage their load the time of day that they're using their load and if it's done well and they're assisted in doing that through automation software and deals from their retailers that can reduce the burden on the distribution system at times of peak load and that has a very significant long-term benefit because as I think you mentioned and it's been mentioned a few times the poles and wires are actually the biggest component of a retail electricity bill, the residential electricity bill. And if by doing this demand management we can reduce the need to, in future, build out the poles and wires, that's a benefit for everybody. So there are many, many different ways that consumers can be rewarded. When we do this demand management, it has to be for a financial benefit to the people who are participating, but then right. everybody Wins. Okay, uh, Mark Butler, on this question of subsidising low-income households uh, to have solar and batteries, um, uh, quite a big one, you'd have yeah. to say. So when, when I was developing the last election policy for Labor, we engaged with a whole bunch of groups who were doing the sort of work that Rosemary talked about. And they didn't, they didn't have a particular policy they wanted the Commonwealth Government to proceed with. What they wanted were local communities to be supported in coming up with their own solutions. In addition mm -hmm. to state governments, local councils are doing fantastic things, including here in Victoria, to support low-income households get access to solar panels and in time, I think, to storage as well. A particular challenge for us is people who don't own their own properties, mm -hmm. so um, renters and well, should people landlords, in Should housing. landlords who make, who make a profit out of their asset be forced effectively by government regulation to put solar panels on the houses. Well, uh, uh, Alan talked about carrots and sticks. I'm not sure we'd force them to do it, but, but I think we need to look at programs that would incentivise renters to do it. Property councils across the country are already demonstrating that you get better rental income, you get better resale uh, for your house if you've got solar panels, and I'm sure the same will be said when storage comes through, but we've just got to make it easier for, uh, for property owners to do this. I think um, there's a great opportunity for state governments that have a whole lot of public housing to start to do this as well. Um, but uh, look, we'll look very carefully at this recommendation. There are already really good groups under the community power rubric okay. doing this across mm -hmm. Australia and they should be encouraged right. to We've come We've got a lot of questions solutions. to get to. Mitchell Dyer has a question for us about the uh, South Australian situation. So South Australia's high reliance on renewable energy, a level that many on the panel have said they want to see the whole nation aspire to, has led to accusations around blackouts and around just un unreliable power systems. So my question is, can wind energy or any other form of renewable energy actually create reliable baseload power without the use of battery or storage technologies? I'll start with Amanda. Mm. The whole point of how you manage a grid is that you should put a range of these technologies together and Dr Finkel outlines this in his report that if you have variable wind and solar we know that you know the sun only shines during the day, well, what do you back it up with? And there's batteries, there's solar thermal technology, biomass, pumped hydro, a whole range of solutions and the idea is that you do it together. 
So far, the schemes that have been in place have incentivised mainly new generation technology, and it's critical that we incentivise new storage technology as well. Did uh, South Australia get that wrong, by the way, um, in order to end up with blackouts because the wind? Well, there were four and independent the storms. There were four independent reports into that blackout last year in South Australia that found that extreme weather, the storm blowing down power lines, was actually the cause of that blackout. So extreme weather is one of the key things we need to think about in preparing our Josh, energy Josh system. Josh shaking his head there, so we'll let him come in. Well, I mean, Jay, Jay Weatherall went to, the, uh, went to the world and said, I'm conducting a big experiment here. And that big experiment has led to 50% uh, uh, wind and solar in his state. And he didn't take any of the necessary precautions to ensure that there was the storage and what Alan details is in his report, the frequency of control and ancillary <coughs> services and the inertia that you do need to stabilise the system. Now, Mark is from South Australia. He described 1.7 million people going to the black as a, as a hiccup, um, but unfortunately, hundreds of millions of dollars was okay. cost and it was a huge problem. So I think... But Josh, we're, gonna, we're rising above this tonight because we're looking at the solutions <laughs> for the future, I think. And uh, first of all, that question has his hand up, so I'll get back to him. <clears throat> well, I just think a huge problem in this debate is that there's a lot of obfuscation and sort of not saying yes or no. So to summarise, you're saying that we need battery storage technology. Renewables cannot provide baseload power on their own. What I'm saying is that yeah, as you get more penetration of renewables, you'll need to bring on batteries. But uh, the Finkel Review outlines this, that actually there's no technology challenge to getting more renewables into the system and the International Energy Agency says this too, it's echoed in reports around the world, that you can have high penetration of renewables but as you're going to, you started the question with you know, uh, powering the whole economy with renewables, that's when you would bring in these technologies as well. Okay, um, Alan, obviously you took lessons from the South Australian situation, what were they? And tr keep it brief because we've got another question to go to relating to this. OK, so we did take lessons from there. We also took lessons from travelling overseas. Some countries like Denmark can get away with a lot of wind without storage because they're connected to countries all around them through massive interconnections and they can call upon hydropower and nuclear and brown coal and black coal and biomass, a lot of resources that we just can't do. South Australia is at the end of the national electricity market. It's, it's sort of like the end of this long string and it doesn't have those interconnections. So we do think you need storage. Um, we've, we've seen that on co after many hot days you'll get coincident uh, low wind, hot weather in, in South Australia and Victoria and without some kind of dispatchability, the more official term for storage, uh, you can run into problems under certain circumstances. And so we have recommended what we call a generator reliability obligation. Now, I'm going to so, pause you there because our next question is okay. on that. I'll come back to you when Maura <laughs> Jeffries gets a chance to ask her question. Maura. Thank you, Tony. Um, energy and climate policies are inextricably linked. Affordability and security and reliability are important. Reducing emissions is even more important. And I'd like to know if Dr Finkel sees any possibility that the generator reliability obligation will have a negative impact on renewable energy investment. Alan. I don't. <laughs> I think that credibility is important as well. And I'm not sure about your judgment on what's the most important. Prices for consumers who are struggling are really important. Having a secure system is really important. We need to optimise all of them. What we've determined is that as new generation comes in, depending on which state you're in, there is a greater or lesser requirement for some dispatchable capability to go with that. So can I just, now, can given, I, can sorry, I just so given, on this yeah. point, your report recommends that by mid-next year, the Australian energy market operators should be given a last resort power. Now, that is a power to step in and force the building of gas turbines, which are there as a last resort. Is that correct? That is correct, but it's absolutely intended as a last resort. What we're recommending is a suite of policies that, if accepted and implemented, should avoid forever the need for that... Um, op, you know, the possibility of the operator stepping in. But if you don't have that possibility for the operator to step in and things haven't worked out for whatever reason, then you've just got a system that's not working. That's not good either. So, so can I just, just hypothetically, the South Australian situation, if you looked at that um, in the current environment, you'd say not good enough, last resort, step in and build a gas-fired turbine that would be there if there was a blackout? Well, you wouldn't step in and the operator build it itself. It would work with the generation companies and 
see what needs to be done to encourage that to happen. It's got to have a forward-looking view. Yeah. You can't make decisions like that in the last <coughs> minute. But, but I suppose the question, going back to what Moira is asking, does that make renewable well, look, energy projects asking, more expensive? It does, um, but at a reasonable level. So look at the rate that wind and solar has come down in price. Look at the rate at which batteries have come down in price. So if today you said that a wind farm or a solar farm had to have batteries, and it doesn't have to be batteries, but let's take batteries. Um, say a 100 megawatt wind farm had batteries for 30 megawatts and four hours duration. It would still be cheaper than a wind farm of the same size five years ago. So we're taking advantage of the march of technology, innovation around the world. We benefit from that and we have the opportunity to make a more robust system and we should. Let's just see very briefly, do the politicians agree with this? Uh, Mark Butler, is this a good idea to have a last resort system in place that forces um, whatever state it is or region to actually have a backup power system like a gas-fired generator? Well, I think this is the next logical step in the discussion of, about how we move to a higher renewables electricity system. And um, South Australia has been doing this now for a while. We've got a, they've got a battery tender out. They're looking at building additional gas generation to firm up the system. And I do want to take issue with your implication that a gas generator in South Australia would have prevented the blackout that happened in September. It wouldn't have. The voltage collapsed because 23 massive steel transmission towers were torn down in a huge storm. These things cause gas, coal and wind to trip. Okay. All right, uh, Josh Reidenberg, uh, just talk to that whether the cost of renewables will go up as a result of these policies. Well, Dr Finkel has asked the Australian Energy Market Operator to determine how much of the capacity and for how long the renewables need to provide the storage. And I think the point's been mentioned, but it needs to be reinforced. It's not just batteries. It could be pumped hydro, which has been a big focus for our government. It could be gas. Um, it could be biomass. It could be a whole lot of other options. Uh, wind uh, only produces power about 35% of the time and solar about 25% of the time. So you do need the storage. Uh, to, to ensure that the, um, that the grid remains stable and that the renewables can be integrated. And we are seeing a greater penetration of wind and solar. It's inevitable uh, under all scenarios. And prices have come down significantly. So I think it's only reasonable that the renewable energy providers are ensuring that they're contributing to grid stability as some of the other synchronous, non-renewable sources have historically done. OK, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A tonight, send a tweet using the hashtags factcheck and quanta. Keep an eye on our Twitter account, RMIT ABC Factcheck, and the conversation website for the results. The next question comes from Zoe Gerardson. An article in The Australian last week claimed that AGL stood to lose the most economically from a clean energy target due to their large stakes in brown coal in Victoria and black coal in New South Wales. However, just a few months ago, the company introduced a policy to be out of coal by 2050. Um, uh, starting in just five years' time. If the country's largest electricity generator can recognise that coal is not the way of the future, despite any perceived negative economic impact, why is it so hard for the government's conservative wing to do the same? Um, Amanda, I'll start with you, actually. <laughs> Tempting to go to Josh, but I'll start with you. A challenge we've had in this debate and why it's continued on for 10 years, well, more than 10 years, is that it's been a classic classic battle between the community and vested interests. And uh, vested interests are continually delayed. It's like the tobacco industry that went before, the fossil fuel industry has consistently uh, thrown doubt on the issue, etc. And we've had a slow grinding process to get to where we are now. So uh, it, it's disappointing that we are where we are, but um, we have to just step forward from here. Josh. Well, no two countries are the same. Um, the United States uh, gets more than 20% of its power from nuclear sources. Uh, France, more than 70%. Uh, the UK also has that nuclear capacity. We in Australia have traditionally relied on coal. Now, the percentage of its role within the overall energy mix has been coming down. Um, and it will continue to play a critical role. And I think it's ignorant to think that... Um, synchronous generation made up of coal and gas should be phased out of our electricity system overnight. It's absolutely critical 
to the reliability of the system and indeed to the cost of the system. But no I one's mean, saying people, that, Josh. But Amanda, no one's saying it Amanda, should be overnight. But Amanda, Everyone's saying it should be and, a transition. And, and can I just say, that's where Dr Finkel has played an absolutely vital role because he has shown uh, in an independent way with an expert panel, right, um, that you can um, ensure a transition over time to meet that trilemma <coughs> with coal continuing to play an important role. And we should be careful um, to focus on inputs as opposed to the outputs and why we have a different position to, to the other side of politics is we want to adopt a technology neutral way. The clean energy target is looking to do that and if you've got uh, coal with carbon capture and storage you can reduce emissions by 90 per cent. Um, now why shouldn't that be incentivised if it's reducing emissions simply because it's coal with new technology. Okay, I'll, I'll come to Alan Finkel in a minute. Let's obviously hear from the other side of the uh, political equation. Well, we'll see how Josh's party room meeting goes tomorrow, but I'm not sure the Liberal Party is taking a technology neutral approach to this. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Barnaby Joyce, said that he was all for a clean energy target provided it pulls through new coal-fired power. Um, I mean, the idea that clean energy can be rigged definitionally to include new coal I just think makes a nonsense of the whole process. Uh, Alan Finkel's report points out that, that the national electricity market used 76% or got 76% of its electricity from coal last full year. I mean, the last thing we need is more coal. If we're going to have any hope of decarbonising our electricity sector, we need to start reducing our reliance on coal, yet Josh has to deal with a party room where people as senior as the Deputy Prime Minister say this clean energy target's fine, provided it allows us to build more coal. OK, so that's, I'm, I'm going to jump in. Uh, I, I will come to you. I'm gonna, we've got a, a question on this subject. We'll go to Max Watson. So the, um, the International Environmental Agency and the International Panel for Climate Change have both recognised that carbon capture and storage, along with renewables and other measures, are all essential technologies if we want to meet our Paris COP21 targets. Um, I was fairly pleased to see that um, the government intends to change the Clean Energy Finance Corporations Act to include CCS to allow this to be a technology agnostic approach. Um, so my question is, will Labor support these measures? OK, starting with you. So if clean coal is clean, isn't it the same clean as any other form of energy? Well, from a carbon point of view, intellectually, if you can capture all of the carbon emissions and pump it somewhere and it stays there, that's, that's all well, good. Well, that's what he's talking about, but, carbon but, no, capture no, I know exactly what he's talking yep. about. Our government put an extraordinary amount of money into research and development into this, uh, into this technology, and all of the remaining funds, some $490 million of remaining funds to drive R&D projects, were cut in Tony Abbott's first budget. The coal industry walked away from research and development and now uses the Coal 21 fund, which it levied from coal companies for R&D into carbon capture and storage. It uses it so for Mark, advertising. So, Mark, like, if uses... you like this idea, the, the, just, to the go, just to go back to the question, are you happy for the Clean Energy Finance Corporation to continue the this, good work that you've if, already done? If, if Josh and his government were serious about CCS, they'd put back in the research and development money that they took out of but the, the question is no, whether, no, The question is whether, no, because but the question was specifically the whether CEF, you would support the CEFC using the CEFC. Is not about, the CEFC is not about research and development. The CEFC is about um, technologies that are commercially deployable. It loans money to a project and that money has to be paid back at a bond rate plus three or four percent. So okay. six or seven percent. Well, let's just go. Yeah. There is no project. Our question, no question, project, question that works this in is the industry. This the most hollow, so cynical I'll, gesture I'll by just go back Josh's to, government. In the spirit of bipartisanship, I say that. The most <laughs> hollow and cynical <laughs> gesture. Um, if they were serious to coal community, they'd, they'd put the money back right. that can they I, Can I just go back to our question? I know you work in the industry. You said that when you submitted the question. So, I mean, what do you think? Is it possible? It's certainly a possible technology. It's being demonstrated in various places around the world. The Gorgon project in Western Australia is about to commence carbon capture and storage on, on uh, natural gas. Now, carbon capture and storage is important, yes, for, the, for cleaning up coal. It's also important on gas. It's also important in biofuels and biomass. It's also important for building your, your wind turbines, um, for capturing the, um, the, the CO2 generated from the generation of steel, mm -hmm. from cement, etc. CCS is essential, okay, essential I, technology I, I, There's, there's a point where these. you're entering the panel here, so I'm going to be careful. It's obviously good to get a good informed comment from, and I'll take that as a comment, uh, from uh, one of the questioners. Now, Alan, um, are you genuinely technology 
neutral? Um, does it matter if it's coal or wind or solar, as far as you're concerned? I think I'm the only genuinely technology neutral person <laughs> in the room, perhaps. <laughs> well, except when I, it comes to nuclear, because you ruled that out. I, no, we didn't. We actually have a discussion about nuclear, and we just point out that unless there's a policy change at the government level, it's not going to have a role, but we're not ruling it out at okay. all. Right. But I'm surrounded by people who hate coal. I'm surrounded by people who love coal. All I care about is lowering prices and lowering emissions. And we've got to do that the most effective way possible. We don't have uh, magic solutions like hot rock geothermal. We don't have nuclear. We do have coal, we do have gas, we have hydro that we're not going to expand. We need to manage and use the resources that we have with the goal of lowering emissions. It just shouldn't matter what the technology is, we should use what's there. As long as the technology is if, effect if effective. If coal with CCS becomes economically viable, and it's on a downward price curve at the moment, but it's still high, but it's coming in the right direction, if it becomes economically viable, then why not? Amanda. Why not? We've got a limited amount of resources to be putting into these things. So <laughs> uh, I see CCS as a bit like you've got a fax machine and you want it to work on the internet rather than saying I'll get a smartphone. And I think that we're the sunniest country in the world, we're one of the windiest. If we can do it anywhere, we can probably do it here. And it's, a, it's about what our vision is for the future. And I get my inspiration when I look overseas at what's happening. 31,000 solar panels were added every hour last year around the world. It's the biggest source of new energy generation. So although Dr Finkel's plan does have this technology neutral approach, it really depends on how low we set the benchmark to make sure that we're incentivising truly, uh, truly reducing emissions. Otherwise, we'll get these um, perverse incentives where we'll be putting public money into other things like new coal for instance, which would just continue to see our emissions go up. I'm going to jump to another question which is about coal. It's from Mark Richards. Hi Tony, thanks for that. I'm one of the um, 750 Hayeswood workers that was recently made redundant um, due to a push to meet the Paris Agreement. What I'd say is that the just transition part of that was missed. Um, from the Latrobe Valley's point of perspective, we've been hit hardest. Uh, the unemployment's at 20.3% in Morwell and more job losses that have come, with no plans for replacement jobs. Mr Finkel, uh, in your 212-page report, I see the word workers mentioned twice. So why doesn't your review consider our Latrobe Valley community or have any measures around an alternative future for any coal-powered regions in Australia that will be hit hard by any form of emissions target? Alan. Mark, we do have a big concern. First of all, um, the reasons for Hazelwood closing were complex economic reasons. But one of the most significant recommendations in our re review, in our report, is for a three-year notice of closure. Hazelwood was inevitably going to close. It was old. People thought it was going to close in 2022. The owners of that brought it forward and gave five months' notice. It's not possible for a community to respond and retrain or do what it can do with government support and community support uh, when you only get five months' notice. So one of our most significant recommendations is that closures of large generators that are going to have impact have to give three years' notice of closure. And that's, we would like to see that to be a recommendation with teeth, where the legislation actually makes the penalties for not following through on that closure properly, quite severe. So it, uh, I'll go back to our questioner. He's got his hand up. I think you've missed the um, question. The question was, what's going to be done about a fair and just transition for workers? There's nothing addressed in your document at all. I mean, that is a local and state and federal government responsibility. We've, we're trying to provide the warning, the three-year notice, so that local, state and federal governments can... Uh, manage that transition more So, Alan, um, they got, was it 11 months' notice? I can't remember well, exactly how much. Five, five months? A, a very short notice. Very short. And you're talking about three years being mandated. We, we actually refer to it as a minimum of three years. So, were these guys abused in the fact that it happened so quickly? Well, I think it's very unfortunate when it happens so quickly. It's, you know, it certainly struck us as something that is bad for two reasons. Bad because of the community impact and bad because you're missing out on the opportunity to signal to the investor community that there's a need to build more, more generation to fill the gap. Tony, okay. this is the human face of the transition that is underway, right? And people who pursue 
um, energy policy and climate policy without understanding the practical impacts it is having out in the communities uh, where people are losing their jobs is, you know, is, is naive. And whether it's the pensioner who goes to bed at six o'clock at night because they can't afford to stay up late because of the, they can't afford the heating in their house, or whether it's the manufacturer who's going to have to send their business offshore because their energy bill has doubled in the last 24 months, that is what's happening out there. And where Dr Finkel's report, I think, gives us a real opportunity is that it talks about lower prices, more certainty, getting more stability and also being consistent with our Paris Agreement. So the three-year um, warning period, welcome. absolutely critical, would you yeah, say? Look, I think um, across the board this has been welcome because the last five coal-fired power stations that have closed, we've had an average of six months' notice. So with the six months' notice and what's happening to the workers that you're seeing here, I'll come yeah. back to you in a second since you've got your hand back up, um, were they... Uh, aren't they uh, worthy of some kind of federal government protection? Well, they're, they're, well in terms of the, the assistant package, we had joined with the state government in making a multi-million dollar assistant package. But, you know, that's coal comfort the, for the people who have just lost their jobs. And I know, like, for example, the local member out there, Darren Chester, you know, he's got people thinking about their future at your lawn or Lo Yang A or Lo mm. Yang B because they're brown coal-fired power generators and their emissions intensity is higher than black coal and, of course, higher than other forms of emission. So our message to you is we are very focused on ensuring that coal continues to play a part in the energy mix and in doing so very conscious of the manufacturing jobs that are at stake across the country. All right, Mark, did you get an answer? I don't believe so. There's tens of thousands of mining jobs coming up that I don't think the workers mind changing their career, but if no one's focusing on the Paris Agreement section that clearly says a just transition, it's not even in the report. How is anyone seriously looking at the effects it's putting on people? I mean, that's the biggest political problem you've got here with jobs. Our unemployment's terrible, it's not getting any better. Which government expects to win by not looking after the people? Yeah. I mean, Mark Butler knows about this specifically. Mark. <clears throat> well, um, I mean, I think the three-year rule is a really, a really important addition. What happened at Hazelwood and it happened in the Iron Triangle in South Australia as well, where people were given a matter of months' notice by private companies. In Hazelwood's case, we all had to wait for a corporate boardroom decision announced from the other side of the world about one of our most important electricity assets, but mo most importantly, the centrepiece of the economy of the Latrobe Valley or that part of the Latrobe Valley. We've got to do better than that. And Dr Finkel's report adds to that, but that's only a beginning. Uh, really, to be a just transition, we have to recognise that there are vast parts of Australia that were built up on coal-fired power and energy-intensive manufacturing, which may be transitioning over the coming decades. I mean, Hazelwood closed because it was a 50-year-old power station. It was always going to close at some stage. Uh, Playford in South Australia was built in the mid-60s. And we have to plan for that and recognise that, that, that there is a need to help those communities um, diversify economically. Now, so that, will be, that will be hard work. It requires the sort of planning that the local authorities in Gippsland are doing very hard. It requires good infrastructure investment to link places like the Latrobe Valley to Melbourne, much better in terms of transport infrastructure, a whole range of other things, thinking through what economic opportunities, what, what skills and what, what advantages those parts of Australia have, and building an economic plan. A three-year notice is a really good start. It's not sufficient, and I think okay. the federal government but and state governments need to think about this much I, I just more want to go back to Josh have. on the three-year start before we go to our final question. The three-year start, um, or the three-year notice, I should say, he says is a good start. It's one of the key recommendations in yeah. the report. Why not just bring that forward so that all of those workers that you said are now facing the loss of their jobs mm -hmm. will, will actually have the protection of the federal government saying you have to do a three-year notice? Well, the Prime Minister was asked about the Finkel report and these individual mechanisms at the COAG meeting, and he said it had a lot to commend itself. So we will go through our proper processes. But you could do that pretty quickly, couldn't you? Look... You could take out that one thing. If, you, if you're really concerned about mm. those people's jobs, mm -hmm. couldn't you take out that one aspect and make that policy straight away? And you could say that about the battery storage aspects, you could say that about this, you could say that about the consumer No, but those support. ones aren't about jobs that are on the line now. You well, just made the point yourself. Yeah, and, and you're right that this is absolutely critical and it's important to point out that Dr Finkel's three-year rule applies not just to coal but also to large-scale generators, be they gas or hydro 
because the impact of pulling it out of the system with such short notice is is very problematic. So you'd like to bring it forward? Well, we <laughs> I'll speak to the Prime Minister about the whole package. <laughs> okay, now there's time for one last question. It comes from Sophie Constance. Thanks, Tony. Assuming there will be political shenanigans until the next election year, what if in, in future elections a progeny of Messrs Abbott and Bernardi becomes Prime Minister <laughs> and changes any relevant legislation, just like the Trump's repeal of Obamacare? What measures, if any, are there or can there be to prevent this happening? Now, Alan Finkel, did you future-proof this against future politicians? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have recommended an orderly transition, and the first element of the orderly transition is that the state, territory and Australian governments agree to an emissions reduction policy and trajectory. So, and that would be um, implemented through the Australian Energy Market Agreement. So, in a sense, it is a little bit future-proofed. So there's an energy security board, is there? I can't remember uh, the name. We've all, that's a separate issue. We've recommended an energy security board that would be set up by Coag Energy Council to, in the first place, deliver on the blueprint, the recommendations in our report, um, and then many other things, including the health of the national electricity market report that it would do annually to look at performance of the market, the risks that it faces, and the opportunities to develop into the future. Once again, is that to take the politicians out of the system? No, it's to make the politicians politicians um, operate through delegation more effectively to do the strategy and policy work that they need to focus on. All right, Mark Butler, future-proofing against future politicians. Wow, that sounds like doing myself out of a job. Um, look, I think, I think we, we, we need to find a way uh, to have a more sensible discussion about this. I mean, I, I look at the UK, for example, which is going through extraordinary upheaval politically. But all through the, the, the period of the last couple of years, including Brexit, losing a number of party leaders, they've managed a very sensible process about setting five yearly carbon budgets. They've got uh, emissions reduction and energy transition policies in place that, that are jaw-dropping from an Australian point of view. And it all just keeps trucking along while the rest of the country seems to be in political upheaval. So, so this is really about trying... I mean, this process arising out of Dr Finkel's report, I think, is try, all about trying to reset the politics of climate and energy and recognising that it, it, it is something that... that engenders a responsibility to future generations that means, of course, we're going to continue to debate the details of it, but the broad framework should be beyond day-to-day -day politics. So, now, we've so got a long do, way do to believe, go to get you, there. You, but. Uh, true. Uh, do you believe that, apart from some of the skirmishes we've seen tonight, that the climate wars, political climate wars, Bill Shorten talks about, are over? Oh, not yet. <laughs> okay. well, no, I just want to be honest about that. We've received a report 72 hours ago. There are still some some significant disagreements between the two major parties. There are still some very significant disagreements within Josh's party, I think, about, about this. There is a long way to go yet. Yeah, right. We we'll, shouldn't we'll, pretend we'll, that we'll this come, is... We'll come back to that in a minute. This is a difficult uh, process. <laughs> Amanda. Uh, Sophie, you mentioned Donald Trump and it's been interesting to see the internal US response to the Do Donald Trump. 250 mayors have come out and said they'll back the Paris Agreement. We've seen the Governor of California forging Californian ties with China on clean energy. In Australia, we've already seen state governments stepping up on renewables and local leaders are really leading the way. So uh, whether it's in the United States or here, um, Cory Bernardi can't beat the economics on this. Um, renewable energy is now cheaper than new fossil fuels. So we're seeing this wave of change. Uh, regardless of climate change or not, the economics is moving in the direction of renewable energy. Rosemary? Yes, I, I think how Christiana makes a fundamentally important point, and that is that the community wants this matter settled. We want to be able to rebuild confidence in this market. We want long-term policy settings, and we want con costs brought under control and reliability and security um, stabilised so that we don't have to worry about these things anymore. So, time for you, Josh. Well, I think uh, the Chief Scientist has presented us with the most significant opportunity in this space in years, and I think the public expect the political class um, to deal with it much more effectively than we have in the past. Um, I think there is a groundswell of opinion in Parliament, regardless of the political views that you hold on other day-to-day -day issues, that business as usual is not an option, and that if we can solve for lower prices, a more stable system and being consistent with our international agreements, 
then that will be a good outcome for the public, which means it's a good outcome for Australia. Now, Josh, you've got the party room tomorrow. And I'm, uh, so just the obvious question, can you guarantee that some of your uh, no. more conservative <laughs> colleagues won't use this blueprint to try and lever themselves back into power? <laughs> um, I'm not as cynical as you, Tony. Um, my view is... You're pretty realistic, uh, I no, think. Yeah, but my, I'm realistic. And, I, you know, my colleagues have been dealing, especially the ones who have been in the parliament for, for decades, they've been dealing with this issue for a very long time. Um, they've got strongly held views. When Bill Shorten comes out and he says, let's end the climate wars overnight, I think they're justifiably a little bit apprehensive and a little bit cynical as well. And what we need to do is settle our position in response to Dr Finkel's report, consult widely with the proper stakeholders, and then we can start to move it through the political process. The, you know, to quote Winston Churchill, this is not the beginning of the end, but just the end of the beginning. A, a final word to Alan Finkel, who obviously produced <laughs> the blueprint. Um, I just deeply hope that this is used for constructive purposes. Our report shouldn't be used as a, a battering ram or a cricket bat to score political points. And I've got a very... Or a magic pudding. Or I've got a very positive feeling that's coming from the discussions, the responses so far, that there's a broad centre here and there really is an opportunity to make a difference. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Rosemary Sinclair, Josh Frydenberg, Amanda McKenzie, Alan Finkel... Mark Butler and this great audience. <laughs>you can continue this discussion on Q&A Extra with Tracy Holmes and Professor Ian McGill of the Centre for Energy and Environmental Markets. They're taking comments on ABC News Radio now and Facebook Live. That's as soon as we finished anyway. Uh, next week, I'll be taking a break. Jeremy Fernandez will be in the Q&A chair with the renowned primatologist Jane Goodall, whose work with chimpanzees revolutionised our understanding of the human species. Australian thinker Rachel Botsman, uh, who's worried about the collapse of trust. The Centre for Independent Studies Research Fellow Peter Curti, Victorian Liberal Senator James Patterson and Labor front bencher Linda Burney. I'll be back in a few weeks' time. Until then, good night. Still got something to say? Join the discussion on Q&A Extra now on ABC News Radio and Facebook Live. The change is coming. I can feel it. I am that change. Clever Man returns June 29 and watch all of season one now on iView. Everyone has shadows. The trick is to outrun them. Sunday, 8.30, ABC. Thursday. Your job is to buy us the time so we can wrap this up to everyone's satisfaction without a trial actually starting. Will a bold legal strategy... We think we can keep your client out of jail. ...backfire. I wasn't here. I didn't know any of this was happening. New Janet King, Thursday, 8.30 on ABC and iView. In Bali, there's one place you won't want to stay. Karabakan Prison has quite the reputation. For the first time ever, a television crew has been granted unfettered access. Foreign correspondent spends a week inside. Gangster, gangster. The home of the Bali Nine. When those doors get shut and locked, and you just think to yourself, what have I done? You feel every moment of those 12 years. Get me home. Foreign correspondent, tomorrow 9.30 on ABC. Good evening, Joanna Nicholson with the top stories from ABC News. Investigators are working to establish what caused a passenger jet's engine cover to rip open.